Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for another opportunity to gather together virtually, Lord of the Sabbath. We invite you to worship with us. We pray, O oh Lord, that we will all enter into the spirit of worship, that all distractions and all um, interruptions that may be in our environment, that they will seize, that we ourselves, dear Father in heaven, will put aside everything we are hanging on to even at this time and step into worship with you, Lord, so that we will get the blessings that you have prepared for us today. Lord, may we not be a stumbling block to ourselves, but may we receive the manna that you have specially prepared for us in this form of the worship of today. Thank you, dear Lord, for hearing. Accept all of our praise, for we ask in Jesus' name. Let all God's people say amen. amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. If we ever needed the Lord before, we sure do need him now. You know, it is, it, is so, it is so wonderful to see how the Lord himself arranges everything uh, as, as when you prepare for, when you prepare to allow yourself to be used by the Lord on a day like today, you come up with a plan and uh, you look at your plan, you review your plan, you make sure your plan looks good to you. And then you get to the Sabbath day and then the song service starts and uh, Brother Ike decides to sing about freedom. And you say to yourself, what's going on here? I, I wanted to talk about freedom. And it's not like we spoke during the week. So how come he's singing about freedom? And then Sister Lorraine says in the morning when I rise, and I think to myself, did my notes go somewhere? Did these folks somehow get a handle of what I intended to say? And then the special music and everything else that has gone and said, if we ever needed the Lord before, we sure do need him now. I must say, I miss all of you. It has been a difficult time. You know, I was thinking to myself just a few seconds ago, as I see out of Matthew on the screen, that if this was in Naka, he, he probably would have pinched me by now and said, keep it short. Um, but uh, it is not in Naka, and I don't know that he knows how to use the chat, so he's not going to be able to say that to me today. Uh, but I look at my time, it's 12 o'clock, and no, I'm not a very long preacher. But these are the things I miss. It was 11 months ago to this exact Sabbath that I sat, because I am standing today, I was not going to sit this time around. I sat a few feet from where I stand today, and I proclaimed. And the Churchill, if he's on the line, asked me later if I was prophesying, but I proclaimed that I was looking forward to when we would all worship together in person. Little did I know, unbeknownst to me, as those who went to school would say, that it would be 11 months later, and I'd be speaking again, just few feet from where I was, and we would still be virtual, Lord have mercy. But I am very, very excited that he has kept our numbers complete. I, I am just excited to the point of tears that none of us has been lost in this deadly sickness. I mean, I don't know about you, but I know many people who have lost people in the last one year. Many, many, many who work for me, many who are part of my organization, who have lost a loved one or who have had a loved one fall sick, fall desperately sick, and have not been the same. But we have even had people in our midst who have fallen sick and the Lord has delivered them. I just praise the name of Jesus this afternoon and I thank him. Uh, we do have people who don't worship with us regularly. So I will just give a bit of a mea culpa here and say I'm not a preacher. It's not what I do for a living, but I do believe that the Lord has something for you today. And uh, I, I just thank you for joining us, for our faithful friends who have joined us. 
I thank Damisi for joining as well. I, I shared with her that I'm speaking this Sabbath and she said she would, she would try and join. And I just thank you, love you so much. Thanks for, for joining and everyone else who has joined, may God bless you and grant you the desires of your heart. It is Black History Month and it's a month where we are supposed to celebrate the accomplishments of Black Americans. And um, I'm probably going to say something that's going to be a little bit uh, controversial, but that should not be new to the members of NACA because it wouldn't be me if I didn't say something that was a little bit controversial. But my experience in this country, having you know, returned back over two decades ago now and lived here for over two decades, is that immigrants don't take this month that seriously. You know, it's, it's we, we generally, and I know that's a generalization, and so there might be people that are a little offended, but I've spoken to a lot of people, and it, it is something they recognize, but don't take that seriously. And I, and, and I want us to use a few minutes this morning before we go into the message to, to impress upon us why we should take this month seriously. I just have three reasons why we should take Black History Month and everything about African-Americans seriously. You see, most of us, if not all of us, would not be here, would not be here. These privileges we're all enjoying, we would not have them if not for the efforts of African-Americans. Many people don't recognize that the Civil Rights Act enacted in 1964, opened the door to the Immigration and Naturalization Act of 1965. And that act got rid of the quota system and basically formed and served as the basis by which every immigration act. So all of you who are here on visa lottery, all of you are here because a, a spouse filed for you. All of us who are here because our work filed for you. All of us who are here because our children filed for you. All of us who are here for whatever reason are here because of what others have done, because of the suffering of others, because people were willing to go in the street and march. People were willing to be thrown in jail. People were willing to make sacrifices for you and for me. So no, we should not take it lightly. We should not take it for granted and just say we are here. That's their business. It's not their business. Their business is why you are here. Their business is why we're here. My second point is uh, that you have to understand, you have to understand that we all have a shared ancestry. You know, for lack of knowledge, our people perish as the word of God says. Do you know that almost 15% of all the slaves that were brought to this country, as an example, came from Igbo land, came from the Bight of Biafra? Do you know this? What that means in practical terms, what that means in practical terms is that there's an African-American most likely that shares ancestral heritage with me right now. Because these are people who were brought here, whether they were kidnapped, whether they were sold to slavery, whether they had committed an offense in the community, and that, that's irrelevant. The point I'm trying to make here is we share the same heritage. That is just one example, again, from the Bight of Biafra. We know that slaves came from all up and down the west coast of Africa. So these people that we sometimes look as being different are not different. In fact, for the longest of times, they refer to themselves as Africans. For the longest of times, they refer to themselves as Africans. And then the last point I just want to make as I try to stress the importance of taking this seriously is 
whether you like it or not, maybe some of us here are going back to Nigeria. Maybe some of us and our children are going back to Nigeria. But for many of us, this is the new home. Your children and your children's children and your children's children's children. And I know some people are saying, God forbid, Jesus, come quickly. Sure, I'm with you there. But if he doesn't come, this is the new home. And it is in our best interest to shape an environment and a society that will treat our descendants right. So don't say this is another person's problem because it will be your problem in due season. In fact, it might already be your problem in due season. So brothers and sisters, Maybe you've always looked at Black History Month as something there. Yeah, let's just go through the motions. Or you might even be saying, Anaka, why are we doing Black History Month? Again, let us not forget what people have experienced for us to be here. Let us not forget what people have experienced to be here. Let us not forget that we are all one. Some of us were just separated many years ago, but we are all one. And so their struggle is our struggle. Our struggle is their struggle. Amen. I have to confess that uh, it's hard for me to think about Black History Month. And it's a month that we're supposed to celebrate without thinking about why we actually have to have a month to celebrate the accomplishments of Black people. I don't know if that bothers you, but it bothers me. What conditions led us to this point that we have to have a month where we acknowledge the contributions of Black people to this great society? And there's just one word for it. That word is slavery. It is the experience of Black people, our brothers and sisters, as I've, uh, I've made the case for, that have caused us to be in a position where we now celebrate. And even though slavery ended officially, December 18 of 1865, the reality still is that many will argue that it has not ended, that it has continued for 400 years. That whenever the first slaves arrived here, whether you believe it's 1619 or sometime before that, it hasn't really changed. How can we say that black people are no longer slaves when we just look at the number of incarcerated black men? How can we say that black people are free when we look at the problems in society? Last summer was a testament to the challenges the black community continues to face in this country. But even when you look outside of this country, Look at my home, my country of my heritage, Nigeria. Look at all the countries represented on this call right now. Can we truly say that we are free? Can we truly say that we are free? And so this is the burden that I have on my, on my uh, heart today, this idea that while we may no longer be slaves, be bound and chained, maybe no longer under colonial rule like those of us from Nigeria, while we may not have overlords and masters, can we really say that we are free? No longer a slave, but am I free? Let us pray. Kumbaya, my Lord. Kumbaya, kumbaya, my Lord, kumbaya, kumbaya, my Lord, kumbaya, oh Lord, kumbaya, someone's praying, Lord. Come by here, someone's praying, Lord, come by here.
someone's praying, Lord, come by here. Oh, Lord, come by here. We are listening, Lord, come by here. We are listening, Lord, come by here. We are listening, Lord, come by here. Oh, Lord, come by here. Father, we've come into the hour. We pray that you be with us. Lord, I am prone, prone to wander, but you are prone to chase. Chase us and bring us back. Free us for we pray in Jesus' name. Brothers and sisters, just because we are no longer slaves does not mean we are free. My brother Victor, thank you for reading the text from earlier. Exodus 12, 31 to, and 40 and 41. We all know the story. I won't spend too much time here. After 430 years of being captives in Egypt, it had now come the time for the children of Israel to get up and go. It was time for them to leave and move on to get the land that God had promised them. My Bible tells me that a king arose in Egypt that did not know Joseph. And so the children of Israel had been captive for four centuries. And there are some who would say that that is how long slavery has existed in this country. But for four centuries and 30 years, the children of Israel had been slaves and now it was time to go. The Lord freed them, the plagues happened, the firstborn died, and now it was time to go. And the Bible says that on the same day south, they left. And I'll just point out for historical purposes that the Africans that came to this country in the 15 and 1600s often saw themselves to be very similar to the Israelites and were longing for freedom from the white slave owner, the Egyptian. And so the children of Israel were free and Lord, the God said, go, go possess the land, the land of Canaan, the land flowing with milk and honey, go possess the land. But brothers and sisters, it's not too long, not too long, just two chapters later, when Pharaoh and his army is chasing behind in, in, in Exodus 14 and 11 verse 12, that we see the children of Israel begin to say, Moses, 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 would it have not been better if we had died in Egypt? The children of Israel were free. They were physically free but they had not left Egypt. Their mind was still in Egypt. And you might be saying, Brother Ebenezer, come on, cut them some slack. They had just left Egypt. And the pressure upon them was all, was very heavy. But the reality is that the children of Israel consistently complained and consistently asked, would it not be better that we were in Egypt? They ask this even at the point of about to enter the promised land. You remember the story, the spies had been sent and they came back and 10 said, oh my goodness, the people in the land, they're tall, they're huge, they're big, we cannot conquer them. And so the people murmured in Numbers chapter 14, the people murmured in Numbers 14, one to four, and they said, <laughs> Moses, allow us to return to Egypt. These were free people. They were physically free, but they were still in Egypt. And so God was so upset that the Lord said in Numbers chapter 14, 20 to 23, I have pardoned them according to your word. But truly as I live and in all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, none of the men who have seen my glory and my signs that I did in Egypt 
and in the wilderness and have yet put me to the test these 10 times. So we know at least 10 times the children of Israel asked to go back, at least. And have not obeyed my voice, shall see the land that I swore to give their fathers. And none of those who despise me shall see it. The children of Israel were free, but they were not free. They were no longer slaves. They were no longer slaves of the Egyptians. The Lord had freed them, but they were still slaves to Egypt. They were still slaves to Egypt. And that slavery caused them to tarry 40 years in the wilderness, just going the long way around. They were on the precipice of the promised land. But because they were still chained to Egypt in their minds and in their thoughts and in their attitudes, they were not free. What is your Egypt? What is your Egypt? What thing of the past has God delivered you from, but you still long for? Is it a job that God delivered you from that paid you good money? And now maybe you're in a new position and the money is not as good. And you say, Lord, eh, I wish I had that old job. Or maybe it's a relationship for the single people in, in, uh, in the sound of my voice. Maybe God delivered you out of a bad relationship. But every now and then you say, Lord, uh, I wasn't so lonely when I was with brother X and sister Y. What is your Egypt? What is my Egypt? Free, no longer slaves, but not free. And the whole Old Testament, in my view, is this back and forth between God and his people. God is trying to tell them, I have freed you. Why do you want to remain in slavery? But God's people continue to reject the fact that God has freed them. And this story carries on from the Old Testament into the New Testament. In fact, God's people were so rebellious in the Old Testament that the physical freedom that they had, they lost. They ended up being slaves again because Egypt was so important to them. And so in the New Testament, we see this in act again. And so turn with me to, your, to, the, to the book of John because we'll finish in the book of John. And there's not much more to say here. But when you go to the book of John, a beautiful book written by the evangelist, and we all know that John's main purpose of writing his book was to pr prove the divinity of Jesus Christ. He wanted his audience to know that Jesus is God. And so it's such a beautiful book. And we go to the book, the chapter eight, John chapter eight. And many of us might remember John chapter eight is a, is a, is a chapter that started off with as one of my good friends likes to say, is the chapter that starts off with the woman caught in the act. He doesn't say adultery, he says in the act. And a woman was caught in the act and people had come to stone her, people had come to kill her, judge, jury and executioner. That chapter starts with people wanting to stone a woman. John chapter 8 ends with people wanting to stone Jesus Christ. And why did they want to stone Jesus Christ? Why do we go from people wanting to stone somebody who was guilty, according to the laws of the land, to wanting to stone Jesus Christ, the Son of God? 
Well, the reason why they wanted to stone Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is found starting in verse 21. And we learn in verse 21 and from that point on that Jesus had had an encounter with the Jews and Pharisees and the learned people. And they were asking him where, he said, I, I am going to where you cannot go. And he had ministered to them. And they were, they were, they were now becoming to believe that Jesus Christ, yes, he is indeed Lord. He is the one who they need to follow. He is the Messiah. They are coming to the point where they now believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And all is looking good and all is looking well. And then Jesus says to them in verse 31 and 32, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, John 8, 31, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Verse 32, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And up until this point, life had been good. Everybody was fine. They had no problem at all with everything Jesus has said. They said, yes, you are the Messiah. But then Jesus says, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And this statement upset the Jews. They said, what do you mean? In verse 33, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? What do you mean you've never been slaves of anybody? Really? Have you forgotten your years in, Babel, uh, in, in Egypt, 430 years? How about the time in Babylon, 70 years? How about the fact that the Romans were controlling the entire area of Palestine, how could they say in good conscience that they had never been slaves? And brothers and sisters, this is what pride does to us all. When we are so proud, when, when, when we have pride, we cannot see our current circumstances and we forget what we were before. People do things and we say we can never do that. We forget that we used to do that and maybe even worse. When somebody comes and says to us, brother, sister, this is something you need to change. Your pride makes you so, and says, no, no, that's not me. That can't be me. I can't do that. The Jews were so prideful that they had forgotten. They, 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 they refused to accept that they had been slaves, when it was well documented in their history. That's the, that's the danger of pride in our lives. But even though the Jews were focused on their history, they were missing the larger point that Jesus Christ had for them. Because Jesus says in verse 34 through 36, truly I tell all of you emphatically, that everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the household forever, but the son does remain forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Jesus was not just talking about their physical freedom. Jesus was talking about their spiritual freedom, the freedom of all freedoms. It actually didn't matter whether the children of the Israelites were quote unquote free. It didn't matter if they were no longer slaves in a physical sense. If they had not been set free from their sin by Jesus Christ, it all amounted to naught. You see, they thought that because they were descendants of Abraham, that they just inherited freedom. And it makes me often wonder how, how often we ourselves think the same thing. I come from a good Christian home. Okay, that's good. But I'm telling you today that that's not freedom. 
I'm a first, second, third, fourth, fifth generation Seventh-day Adventist. That is all nice and dandy, brothers and sisters. That is not freedom. You can recite all the verses in the Bible. God bless you. That's good, but that is not freedom. You know all the stanzas in the SDAH. You sing them all by heart. You don't have to look at the words. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. That's good, but that's not freedom. Every year you say, I will serve in the church. I will do this. I will do this. That's wonderful. God bless you. Continue to do it. But I'm telling you today that that is not freedom. Maybe you're a vegetarian like me. You eat God's own diet and you say, Lord, help me. This is a, that's a good thing. I'm encouraging everybody. Join me. But I'm telling you today, that is not freedom. Maybe you can sing to the point where people begin to cry and just lie on the floor because of how good your voice sounds. May the Lord continue to use you. But I'm telling you today that that is not freedom. It doesn't matter what you and I do. If the Son has not set us free, we are still slaves. If the Son has not set you or me free, we are still slaves. We may be physically free. We may be physically free like the Israelites were. But if we are not set free by God, we are still in Egypt. They were physically, physically free. No longer slaves from that perspective. But spiritually, they were still in Egypt. In Jesus' day, they were still in Egypt. And I fear for myself and for you, that we might still be in Egypt. You see, brothers and sisters, what shall it profit any one of us to gain the whole world but lose our own soul? It is Christ's desire that we be free. Galatians 5 verse 1 says very simply, it's actually a very interesting text. Galatians 5, 1 says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free, not for anything else, for freedom. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Stand firm and do not be drawn to Egypt. Stand firm and do not chase after money at the expense of your salvation. Stand firm and do not chase after relationships at the expense of your salvation. Stand firm and do not chase after status at the expense of your salvation. Stand firm. And do not chase after the things of this world at the expense of your salvation because God desires for us to be free. This is Black History Month. And over the last couple of months, many of us have gotten very active in championing and advocating for social justice, for freedom. And that's all good. It's important because the, the word of God tells us in Proverbs 31, verse 8 and 9, that we must advocate for those who cannot advocate for themselves. But I have to remind us, I just have to remind us that all these things are meaningless if they don't come as a result of our freedom in Jesus Christ. We cannot put the affairs of this world ahead of the affairs of God. We cannot do this. For even though we may be physically free, we will still be bound and slaves of sin. And so as I close, my appeal is very, very simple. The Jews and the Pharisees, the children of Israel, they all failed to see that even though they were no longer physical slaves, they truly were not free. And I just can't help but think to myself, what things have given me a false sense of confidence 
that I am free? Is it because I'm an elder in the church? Is it because I pay my tithe? Is it because I do this and that and the other thing? Or could it be that I am still a slave and that the son himself have not let me, have not been set free by the son? Jesus says, come on to me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Being free is to know the truth. And Jesus said in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one comes to the Father except through me. There is no way to be free except knowing Jesus Christ. And so the question is, what is your relationship with Jesus Christ today? Do you know Jesus? Do you know him? We know that when the Bible uses the word no, it is not talking about intellectual knowledge. It is talking about intimate relationship. Adam knew his wife. We know what that means. That is what the Bible is saying. If you know the truth, it's not you know the verse. It is do you know Jesus? Do I know Jesus? What is my relationship? How intimate is it? Because it is only in establishing and developing and growing an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ that we can be set free and free indeed. Maybe there's someone on the call today under the sound of my voice who wants to give their life to Jesus Christ. Maybe you've never done it, or maybe you've done it in the past, but after this sermon, you recognize, you, you've been pricked to know that, no, I've become a slave. I've returned to Egypt in my mind. And so maybe today you want, to, you want to give your life again for the first time or renew your commitment to Jesus Christ. Maybe you've backslidden. Maybe you've done something that you're not proud of. Or, or maybe you've allowed sin to have dominion over you. You know, sometimes people say... Uh, being a slave to sin means that we no longer sin. No, that's not what Paul was saying. Because the Bible says if we confess our sins, so the Bible knows that we will fall. But what Paul was saying when he said being a slave to sin is being under the dominion, having a master. Sin is now your master. Sin now determines what you do all the time. And maybe you found yourself in this place. Today, we want to pray for you. And so if this is you, you can type your name in the chat. You can use the uh, icon to raise your hand. You can stand up. You can kneel down. The Lord sees you. This is a different time. You know, we might have done an altar call if we were physically in church, but still God sees you wherever you are. And so if this is you, then I want you to indicate so that we'll pray for you. And then my second appeal is this, because if you're like me, this sermon really challenged me personally to say, Lord, how often am I referring to Egypt? How often am I creating a false Abraham and, and, and denying my true position? And so if that is you and you just want to rededicate yourself to God this morning or this afternoon, then again, wherever you are, you can type in the chat, you can raise your hand, you can kneel. The Lord sees you wherever you are. But what is most important is that you make this commitment. And so as I will ask Elder Ola B to pray for all of us that we will experience true freedom in Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we 
come before your throne of grace this morning or this afternoon, Father, thanking you for the message and the messenger today, Father. Mm -hmm. leave no more, Father. We pray this afternoon, Father, as you heard this message, that we look back into our private lives, our personal lives, Father, mm -hmm. that the chain that is bounding us to those things from Egypt, Father, we pray that you break the chain this mm -hmm. afternoon, Father, mm -hmm. whether it's our own, whether it's a career, Father, whether it's a class, whether it's the money in the bank today, Father, whether it's a relationship that is, was toxic, Father, mm -hmm. we pray, Father, that you break that chain Jesus. and take us away from Egypt, Father, and take us to the promised land. Amen. And we pray, Father, give us the wisdom not to look back, yes. just like Lord's wife. Amen. We don't want to look back, Father, because you have set us free. Yes. Now it's up to us to remain free, yes, Father. Father. So we thank you, Father, for what you are doing in our life. We thank you, Father, for what you will do in our life, Father. We pray, Father, we don't take all these things for granted because we are so selfish in nature, mm -hmm. Father. We pray, Father, that your wisdom that you gave Solomon, Father, you give us during this time, Father. Yeah. Even as this pandemic is ravaging everybody, Father, we thank you for your protection over us, Father. Okay. Don't let us look back to last year what happened. Let us look to next year what will happen, Father. Amen. Because by looking up to you, Father, then we are not looking back at what was before us. Mm -hmm. So we thank you, Father, for your wisdom and your guidance in our life, Father. Mm -hmm. And we pray, Father, that once again, Father, please break the chain. Mm -hmm. Break the chain. Mm -hmm. Let us go forward and not backward, Father. All the things that we have done in the past is in the past. Let us look to the future. Yeah. We, are, we are welcoming the soon coming of your son, Jesus Christ, Father. Amen. And we pray, Father, for guidance. And we pray, Father, for all these things, Father, because we know without you, we are nothing. Amen. We cannot accomplish any of that by ourselves. But with you, Father, we can reach the mountain top. Mm -hmm. So today, Father, as we look up to you, Father. We pray, Father, we reach the mountain where you are already setting a place for us, mm -hmm. where you are, your son is preparing his place for us. So thank you, Father, for all these things this afternoon, Father. And we pray, Father, that we don't take the, all these things for granted again. Praise your name and praise the sons and your Holy Ghost. This I pray for in your son's just Christ's name. Amen. Amen.